Thank you. Yeah. Uh, kia ora koutou, ngā mahi nui ki e koutou katoa. Ko Kupukairoa, te maunga, wai te ateaua, tauronga, te moana. Ko ngai te rangi, ko te arawa ngā iwi, ngā pōt ke tāpū, and ko Vanessa Taikato, tō ko ingoa. Um, I'm a marine ecologist, um, work with Tonkin and Taylor right now, and I just wanted to thank them for letting me come and hang out with you guys today. Um, I'm going to be speaking about my PhD research, which broadly looks at traditional management of shellfish and other aquatic species. And hopefully this works. <laughs> Damn it! I'm <laughs> <laughs> just going to push a little button. All right. So, hundreds of years before our time, different forms of resource management were being successfully employed in Aotearoa. And one of these management tools was to transport and relocate plants and animals to new areas. And Māori and our Polynesian ancestors have a long history of doing this very successfully. Māori have put great efforts into the transfer of fish around Aotearoa and establishing new fisheries. And one example is that of the endemic fish smelt, Porohe. A generally accepted view, no, we're not there, is that smelt was introduced to Rotorua and Rotiti lakes by Europeans as trout food in the early 1900s. However, research into traditional knowledge and European documents referring to these species has led to the understanding that smelt was actually translocated there by Māori. The introduction of trout was at the expense of traditional Māori fisheries. Fisheries managers have gone so far as to prohibit the taking of species established by Māori, with the reason being that these species were not for human consumption, but were for food for trout. Kōrero Tuku Iho tells of many different tools used to transport animals, such as the transport of fish within these huge pātua, big old buckets made of tōtara bark. Inanga and smelt are suggested to have been transferred to Makatū and Rotorua from areas further north, walking great distances and transferring them in hue, transferring them in hue or gourds filled with seawater. Māori have had up to thousands of years to enhance natural stocks of fish with favoured species. The purpose of such activities stem from the urgent need to provide a sustainable food source comparative to European introductions, which was usually for sport or for commercial reasons. See what we got next. Yep. All right, so for my PhD, I explored the hypothesis that Māori undertook long distance transport and translocation of a taonga bivalve species down the length of Aotearoa, <laughs> down the length of Aotearoa during the earliest phases of. Māori occupation, giving rise to a population that is now considered to be natural. Don't know if that made sense with all of the clicking. But here we are. So this may have occurred by migratory trade or exploratory routes from parent populations located in the west coast of Te Ao Maui and going, oh, you can't even read that, that's fine. <laughs> All going all the way down to um, Muruhuku in Southland, giving rise yeah, to a population that's completely disjunct and it makes no sense that they're so far away from each other. So this is a little bit about the Tohiroa fisheries. Um, they are a staple in a taonga for many hapu with the whakapapa of Tohiroa intrinsically linked to and having shaped several iwi in areas of Te Tai Tokuro. Tōhiroa has been exploited intensely in the past 100 years, both commercially and recreationally, with the early 1900s European perspective of the animal as being an inexhaustible resource. It was the first seafood to be commercially harvested and exported overseas. And all of this was undertaken with little to no acknowledgement of iwi as knowledgeable kaitiaki of that resource. Due to intense depletion of the bivalves, commercial harvesting ceased by the late 1960s, and recreational harvesting, harvesting was banned at Te Onoroa Atohe, Muruai and Pero in 1971, 76 and 80 respectively. Tōheroa numbers have never returned to the state where the recreational fishery was stable enough to reopen and they are heavily protected. Up to 50 tōheroa if you collect them faces a fine of 500, more than that faces prosecution 
and a maximum fine of $20,000, so don't do it. I never want to touch this again. Okay. Along the west coast of Te Kau Maui, with an iwi such as Ngāti Whātua, certain whānau continue to follow the mahinga kai of Tohiroa formed and worked by their tipuna, maintaining that intergenerational kaitiaki tanga of the taonga species. Traditional management methods of Tohiroa has included the transport and reseeding or whakati puma tātai of Tohiroa to depleted beds or the introduction of Tohiro to new beaches, and this has been undertaken by several kaitiaki in the recent past. So there are many methods surrounding contemporary translocation, but I wanted to explore how it may have been undertaken in the deep past. No. Evidence to the Waitangi Tribunal around the tools used by Māori to undertake reseeding has been given by Rick Toe, Rimurapa and Poha was and still is used in the planting or seeding of Kaimuana around our coastline. Seafood did not just appear around our coastline, waterways and lakes, in most cases those foods were planted there by our ancestors. That is Williams 2016. So I'm going to change the channel a little bit and speak here about an archaeological investigation I undertook. Uh, I did this to better understand Tohiroa distribution throughout Aotearoa through time and try to gain an understanding of Tohiroa gathering by Māori hundreds of years ago. So I did this desktop study of shell-midden sites across Aotearoa and I looked through hundreds of reports, publications and GIS files for any evidence of Tohiroa within midden sites and it took a very long time. I also looked at artefacts in midden sites such as lithic and stone material Ponamu Tuhua Analyzing this lithic material can help us understand mobility and migration patterns, and it's key to understanding early period adaptation across the world. Within Aotearoa, tuhua is a particularly powerful tool in understanding Māori movement and communication north and south. The south coast of Murihuku is separated from northern tuhua sources by more than 1,500 kilometres, yet tuhua has been found within the oldest archaeological sites along the southern coastline. This tells us that Tuhu has been transported by Māori down the country during the, during the earliest phases of Polynesian settlement and pro provides evidence for the presence of northern Māori in the south and during the earliest phases of Māori occupation. Hmm. Let's see what I've got now. Shalmanans can help us understand early Māori occupation and cultural adaptation. That looks terrible, I apologise. Globally, the analysis of shellfish middens has helped understand key events in human history, such as human dispersal, resource management and human impacts on interdital environments. Further to this, shell middens can reveal species distributions and ecology. So the results from my board scale midden survey are shown in this image, which looks a lot better, thank goodness. Along the west coast of Te Kau Maui, covering an area of 330 kilometres of coastline, 968 middens were identified by me and searched, well, by lots of people, and then they put it on a database, and, searched f and I searched them all for Tohiroa, and of these middens, 40% were found to have Tohiroa present. Uh, this is only a partial representation of the middens that exist there. There are hundreds more that have never been documented. And so this number is probably wildly off. It's probably way more. Along the south coast, approximately 140 kilometres of coastline was searched for middens. And of the 122 midden sites that I found that were recorded, only 6.5% or eight of them contained tohiroa. So... If Tohiroa were endemic to the south, we would expect them to be ubiquitous across the midden sites, reflective of what we find in the north. Um, and the results here provide additional support that Tohiroa were not in the south for as long as they were in the north island. Large mounds of curated shells stand today as monuments of long-term sustainability. I feel like this is 
a direct reflection of the indigenous tohiroa fishery and the middens found along the west coast of Teke Ao Maui, in which there are thousands. It was clearly very sustainable for a very long time. A bit about Tohiroa. Um, Tohiroa are the largest endemic surf clans in Aotearoa. They are heavily protected, as we talked about. They are robust and remarkable creatures, and I love them. Mm -hmm. They are able to bury deep within sediments due to their larger muscular foot and the extension capacity of their siphons. They are intertidal, found in beds on the high tide mark, and they occupy very specific habitats along the beaches where they are found. And they're also able to migrate and move away if they don't like so, the environment. So I wanted to understand if they could survive a long journey out of their habitat, and the short answer is they certainly can. They can survive long periods without food, without oxygen. They can undergo long periods of anaerobiosis, which is an alternate respiration pathway that doesn't require oxygen. And when you move them out of their environment, the leading causes of their deterioration is bacteria, bacteria growth and changes or usually increases in temperature. So managing bacterial growth and temperature changes would be a very easy thing to do if you were to move them long distances. So Recto talks about a tool used in shellfish relocation, the Rimurapa and Poha, and this is a narrative that appeared a few times throughout my research, so I decided to run with it because it sounded awesome. Rimurapa is a large brown algae, the southern bill kelp or Davilia, and Poha is when the kelp is turned into a bag or bladder, primarily used for the storage of food. The blade of the species has a honeycomb-like structure, and when split down the middle, it forms an airtight bag. Airtight bag. It is very, very cool. I just felt so, felt so privileged to be able to do stuff with them and learn about them. They were awesome. <laughs> uh, Poha was an important adaptation to facilitate storage and exchange specific to the needs and resources of the South and to take advantage of seasonal abundance. So Poha and Rimurapa have been used by Māori for hundreds of years, specifically by Southern Māori, and um, they're not only a useful tool, they were symbolic, often associated with mana, matauranga, and rangatiratanga of an area and its resources. Within Mirihuku, Mahikakai Rimurapa was centred around the Titi season. The annual harvest of Rimurapa occurred in December or January before the Titi season began at the beginning of April. And back in the day, a large blade could make up to four or five poha, and they were huge. You can see here, them blowing them up, ginormous. It is suggested that the lack of hapu being able to carry out their Mahikakai practices in the late 1800s has led to poor quality kelp, much like the need to prune a tree to produce better fruit. So Rimurapa and Poha are suggested to have been used in transport of shellfish and other marine resources. And uh, further to this, Kōrero suggests that Poha has been used as a tool to seed or plant shellfish species into new areas. Which is a little case study. So in 2007, a restoration case study was undertaken by Wakefields, which utilises traditional management practice of Ngāti Kūri. In response to the decline of the Murehia seagrass along the Kaikoura Peninsula, this case study was a small part of a larger PhD, which was anthropological in nature, unique in its methodology. It was a collaborative kaupapa Māori philosophy and framework which focused on traditional knowledge authentic to the hapū and the application of this knowledge. So Ngāti Kūri recognised the ecological importance of seagrass and their use as an indicator of the health of an area. And so a restorative plan was developed to translocate the murea here using traditional methods of reseeding to assist the regrowth of healthy seagrass communities along the Kaikoura Peninsula. So seagrass was translocated with blades and rhizomes intact using poha. Small holes were made into the blade of the rimurapa and they pushed the um, rhizomes through the blades so the leaves of the seagrass were sitting on one side and the roots were sitting on the other. And then they buried these poha laden, seagrass laden poha 
into the sediment and anchored them down using loose lime rocks, which sounds like a really cool experiment. Um, the monitoring of this took place over a year and the results found that the poha remained stable and the seagrass had grown. The trials indicated poha was an ideal incubator or kohanga for the seagrass and their rhizomes. And this exercise was a successful example of utilising mā tauranga, authentic to a hapū and their ability to adapt this knowledge and construct slightly new knowledge specific to an environment through observation, trial and error. So I wanted to explore the theory that holding shellfish in pōha could aid in promoting the shellfish health. I first hypothesised that while the tissue of the algae was alive, it may continue to photosynthesise when in pōha form. So when we filled the bags with seawater and put the tōheroa in the bag, exposed the bag to enough light to stimulate photosynthesis, the algae may replenish the dissolved oxygen within the bag that the bivalve respiration would quickly remove. And my second hypothesis was around the algal tissue influencing bacterial growth on and around the shellfish when they were held in the bags. So algae generally have high concentrations of antibacterial secondary metabolites because they live in highly diluting and volatile marine environments. So the pōha may produce these antibacterial properties and it inhibit bacterial growth on the shellfish that might be occurring when they're being held or incubated in there. So, <laughs> I, ah, I see, yes, the PowerPoint's changed, Al, that's why, yep. <laughs> um, so when I did this, I placed the pōha, in, uh, tōheroa in pōha and non-pōha treatments with seawater and water, and I exposed the pōha to light. Over the course of a day, I measured, measured, measured dissolved oxygen intermittently. It was a very long day and um, I found a very interesting trend that kind of looks like this but not really. Um, so when the pōha treatments, within the pōha treatments, um, oxygen was declining until about category three, also known as four hours, and um, at that four hour mark the dissolved oxygen was found to stabilise and it was kept at that for maybe three more hours. So Dissolved oxygen stripped, photosynthesis kicking in, and then that dissolved oxygen was maintained while in the non poha which is the pink, um, oxygen just steadily declined. So, kind of, the poha bag was breathing for the tōhiro. <laughs> but, oh, I'm scared to click it. Okay. Uh, to assess the second hypothesis, I collected swabs from tōheroa and pōha and non-pōha treatments. I grew bacteria on agar plates and I measured the bacterial presence between treatments. And the aim was to see if pōha would affect bacterial growth type and abundance when the shellfish were held in the bags. I um, grouped the bacteria by subgroups, uh, by colour and size, and I compared diversity and abundance of bacteria across all the treatments. Well, that one worked, that's nice. So from the results, the ordination showed strong differences in bacterial communities between the pōha and the non-pōha. The pōha were found to inhibit certain types of bacterial subgrowth. Yeah, bacterial sub, oh, bacterial subgroups. And this experiment showed that while the algal tissue was still alive or still viable, the pōha may be able to support bivalve health by inhibiting bacteria and replenishing oxygen within these bags, but this would only happen for a very short time while uh, the tissue was still alive. So the current study only investigated pōha in its raw form. Traditionally, pōha are often curated, undergoing several drying and rehydrating processes to become a long-term receptacle for storage and transport. So the implications of traditional curation processes in terms of retaining these antibacterial metabolites and aiding in that food preservation, which is known to occur with the TT, that would be a really, really interesting thing to explore. But I didn't have any time. But when considering the use of fresh pōha as a temporary whare for bivalves, characteristics of the brown algae investigated in this experiment may contribute to their protection, but only for a short time before they 
start to deteriorate themselves. I don't know what I've got next. Don't worry about that. Um, I guess going back to the bigger question, um, did long distance translocation of tohiroa occur? There is no definitive answer, yes or no. However, the information that I have collected certainly does support this theory. I've only touched on a few of my uh, chapters. There are several more. Um, I should probably publish them, but probably too lazy. Um, uh, but more important than this is that my thesis empowers and shines a light on traditional knowledge, traditional practices, and I think in that way my PhD has achieved its purpose. So, yeah, currently I am an ecologist now, so I'm, I'm quite removed from this research space. I did it like two years ago. That's why I was fumbling a bit. Um, and it's a little bit sad to be away from this kind of research, but I've learned a lot over the past two years about the policies and processes which are currently in place for environmental and ecological management, not thinking about the current government and all that um, shit show. Mm. Um, and um, what I'm finding is there is such a lack of communication between many groups of people. So yeah, traditional management practices have had a long history of success and it's important that these be recognised. But I think right now there is a great sense of urgency in those of us who live and work in the marine and freshwater spaces, who come from wildly different knowledge systems, different disciplines, different worlds basically, how we better find a way to talk to each other, because we really don't. <laughs> and we're all siloed being siloed like, like we often are. It's not helpful, I think. We need to figure out how we can better engage with each other with respect and with that common goal that of the protection of our environments and our resources ultimately so we can feel secure that what we are doing is for the betterment of our future generations and whom their hands all of this will fall very soon um, yeah that's the end of that I don't know why that's there. I would like to thank the following practitioners for generously sharing all their knowledge, all of these people. And I want to thank Phil as well for taking me on this journey so long ago. <laughs> and here's a nice little quote. Yes, that's me. Goodness gracious. turned up, he's turned up on Taronga time, so he will be presenting after Vanessa. <laughs> what a treat, eh, the brother? Anyway. I just have a, um, some feedback, really, about the process that you've gone through, Vanessa. Um, at Parerua, we're the only manawai at the mound. And um, in the 19... And it must have been about the 1940s, um, my father was raised at Matapehi, but for three months of the year, him and his whangai mother would travel on a buggy to the mount. And they used to reside for three months by a river <coughs> called Tewa or to Koraku, which is um, buried by the Borough Council, Mount Borough Council in the early 1950s, I think. I'm sure it's still there, underground. Mm. Um, but anyway, it was a lot of kai moana was gathered there um, because the river connected to, you know, the moana, the harbour there. And they used to gather the seafood, pipi, uh, tuangi, catch fish, and then they'd take it and put it into the Waipu Bay mm. um, for months on end and that was sort of like their garden. So they'd undertake, seafood. would that undertake that activity over a long period of time, yes. over months? Wow. Like a, oh, wow. Um, and to feed the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it was just interesting um, what sort of processes, my, the question I keep asking myself, what did they use? I mean, you're talking about a koha, 
Really interesting. Uh, they must have had something. Yeah, like what that did they use? Yeah. To carry the seafood. I'd say a lot of. Put them in the, yeah. the water to, so that they kept living. Sometimes I feel like they could just chuck them in the waka. Mm -hmm. They, no, they would. Think so? They would survive. Yeah, they're very robust. They also did experiments on tuatua, which are a lot like pippi, because that's not that much of a. Drive. drive. It would have been in, the, in those days. But if you did it, I suppose, by water in the waka, your big kete in the waka, I just go back to the waka, I feel like that it was that, that would have been utilised a lot in transporting lots of species around. Um, but it's dependent on how much and how frequently. Yes, Philip? Um, I was wondering, from your experiments, And not water. Oh, and the buggy. Um, it's also dependent on, they've got knowledge of that animal, so they might go, you know what, I'll have it outside and the kids for a little bit, but I need to go and dunk it back in the water for a little bit. Stuff like that. So if you're just thinking about the pippy sitting out there all stagnant with someone not actually caring for it while they move it, it would not lo last that long, a couple of days, and it would be in a state by the end. But I really feel like that when they were moving these, they had really great knowledge of their physiology, the environment which they came from, the environment they were going to put them to. Like it was all, it was science, really. Um, so yeah, who knows? I'd love to go back in time and just watch. Mm -hmm. I need a time machine. <laughs> Anything else? Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.